Hey guys, and welcome to this edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast, talking everything Carolina football. We're going to take a look at some of the spring storylines today with my man Josh Marlowe, former co-host. He's back, so uh, he'll talk about that. Look at the greatest player bracket that I ran online that just finished up. And also talk about the 2019 recruiting class to this point. So welcome in my buddy Josh. Hey man, how's it going? Good. How's it going with you today, dude? Yeah, pretty good, man. Um, you know, de- definitely. I know uh, we're starting to get pumped for Carolina football, and uh, I know you you were talking to me uh, just yesterday, and man, you're you're definitely excited to get this thing started, aren't you? Yeah, I'm really psyched up. You know, college basketball is done. Masters concluded yesterday, and for you know us, we're not baseball guys or NASCAR fans, so it's. It's April and we're ready. We're ready for September. So you know, it's never too early to talk football. It's a 365 day sport now, and um, I'm really pumped for this year. Even though we had a, a disappointing year last year. Yeah, I mean for sure. I think that's one of the top storylines coming into spring is the fact that you know these guys definitely have a chip on their shoulder coming off a three and nine season. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think so far all the reports that we're hearing coming out are are, are pretty good. Uh, I mean, what you know? I, I know you know a lot of Tar Heel fans have a pretty good perspective coming into this year. What's your perspective on the team? Uh, are we talking about like expectation or? Yeah, um, yeah, we could talk about expectation because apparently, you know, we know that we're not the we we don't expect much out of this team. Apparently, so uh, expectation wise, um, make a bowl game. Um, I'm not saying they need to you know, win the Coastal or anything like that. But it'd be nice to at least, you know, when we're in November, we're still, you know, competing for a chance to to play in Charlotte. Um, but to do that, the main thing is, is they got to stay healthy. You have so many guys miss games like they did last year, this year, it's going to be hard to win games. Um, but I expect them to be better on both sides of the ball. Um, you know, beat State, beat Duke. Uh, you know, we, we can't keep losing those games and, and really just, just be competitive. Last year, there were some games we were competitive and some games we weren't. Um, I think we just got to get back to competing, you know, every Saturday, no matter who the opponent is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're, you know, we're definitely on the same page there. I, I definitely think this team can compete for the ACC Coastal Division title. I wouldn't say that they're going to win it. I think what Miami has going on down there is is something that could end up building into something special down the line. But at the same time, you know, I would like to see this team get back to sort of that even you know that eight and four, nine and three type mindset where you know we're, we're there the last week of the year. And yeah, if, if a couple of teams do have an off season. You know, maybe we we do slip in there to you know go to Charlotte and and play for an ACC title. Um, but I agree, we got to stay healthy. And again, you know, right now in, in the spring, I, I think there are some injuries. Um, yeah, but I I don't think there are really too many to worry about yet. But you know, we we all know that injuries have been an issue for us. Um, so I mean, you know, we we look at the spring storylines. I think the biggest one is probably no spring game. I know when I first heard about it, I was I was kind of scratching my head a little bit, and even kind of more now uh, with the fact that you know we've learned that this is a Larry Fedora decision. This is not a, a, a athletic department decision, you know, based on the fact that there aren't going to be uh, the stadium's not going to be ready. Ba- basically, I think they gave him the green light uh, to hold the spring game, and Larry said, "We're just going to hold an extra practice and you know say forget about the spring game." So, you know, what is what is your reaction to no spring game on April fourteenth? Uh, as a fan who was for you know expecting to go to make a trip out of it, I was disappointed. But like you know, it's like Larry said, um, when they have the spring game, they you lose valuable reps for certain guys that you need to get reps. And I think what he's looking at from last year is you look at, if you know, let's just say we have another catas- catastrophic injury situation. We had a lot of guys who were playing that missed reps in the spring and in the summer. So I think his, his view is like, we're going to get as many reps for as many guys as we have as, as possible. Um, and the spring game limits that for certain players. Um, I mean, it sucks because it's a chance for the fans and even the coaching staff to see what they got in a in a live situation. Um, but I mean, I think I trust what he's doing. I think you, you know 
try something new. Some some schools have started to not host in spring games, and then you got some that make a really big deal out of it. But you know, for us, I, I think if if it's all about getting reps and everything like that, I'm okay with it um, as long as they put the guys to good use. Yeah, after a year of injury, I mean, getting reps is definitely not something that we're going to frown upon. So. Um, you know, I know the other storylines, you know, another quarterback battle, it seems that we have one every single year. And at this point, they say that none of the quarterbacks are separating themselves. I, I don't know if that's entirely true. I'm assuming that that's just kind of coach speak and that somebody has definitely stepped up. It's just kind of a question of who it is, whether it's Nathan Elliott or Chad Surratt or maybe one of the freshmen even going off. But from what I heard, I remember the first interview that we saw from Larry during the spring. He really said that the freshmen were kind of where other most other freshmen have been. To me, that's not really encouraging uh, that right. one of those guys is going to come in and take over, but you know, right now, do you, you know, do do you believe that that it really is as close as Larry is saying, or do you think that someone's probably uh, pushed themselves ahead, or maybe even two of the guys have pushed themselves ahead uh, to have their own battle? Uh, I think it's a little coach speak because that's you know every coach does that, especially this early in the in the process. Um, you know, I was listening to Lee Pace on the Carolina Insider pod, and, you know, he's as connected with anybody. And he pretty much said pretty much what Larry said. You got Elliot and Surratt, who, like, if, you know, if you had to put your depth would be your one and two, but the freshmen, Reuter and the other one, have done really good, uh, or as good as they can do being freshmen in, in Larry's offense. Um, I think if we played a game tomorrow, you'd probably see Nathan Elliott as your starting quarterback. But, you know, they both have – him and Surratt have both a lot to work on. Um, I just hope when we get into fall camp and we get to that first week, we have a, a, a quarterback, okay, this is our guy, and unless he gets hurt, we're riding with him. And we're not doing this, you know, every third series to put a new quarterback in because we've seen how that's worked for us since Larry came here. Yeah, I mean, we all remember the Liberty game that was a straight-up disaster. And thank you, Jeff Schottmer, for saving us because who knows what would have happened – if he doesn't pick that ball off and return it for a touchdown there because the offense just never really got a flow. i am never been a fan of the two-quarterback system, so I totally agree with you there, and I, I, I hope they do find someone. I think, you know, Elliott's probably going to be the guy right now, but, man, if Chad Surratt has really improved as much as some people are saying by going out to California, who knows? Maybe you do give him another shot, and, and, and let's see what he's got. Um, I know we were talking about this yesterday with Jordan Brown having the injuries in the uh, in spring camp. He's been out, or not out, but he's had to put on the red shirt and kind of um, he, he's had to take it easy in practice. I know Michael Carter is probably getting a bulk of the carries. I, from what I've heard, that's that's the that's true. And you know, at this time, you know, we've looked at what he did last year: five point eight yards per carry. You know, 559 yards and eight touchdowns. I mean, that's just great numbers, especially for a guy that only carried the ball 97 times a year ago. You know, I, I asked you yesterday, is it Michael Carter's time? And, I mean, do, do you think it is his time? Um, yeah, I think he should be the feature back in the offense. Um, we know that we rotate players and all that good stuff, and I'm okay with that. But, you know, he – is as close to Giovanni Bernard as we've had since we've had Gio. He's a big play, but every time he touches the ball, um, he's athletic, you know, can get to the corner, you know, all that good stuff. I think Jordan Brown should still have a role in the offense. I mean, the guy had 600 yards rushing last year, three touchdowns. Um, but to me, he would be, and I told you this yesterday, like, not just what, what Ryan used to was in the old days, but that should be kind of his role. Like, when we need a third and two, he's our third and two back. He'd be our third down back in short yardage. And then in the fourth quarter, when we got the team, you know, with their hands on their hips, gasping for air, we're the, he's the one we're, we're running down the throat to keep the, the clock moving and the chains moving. So um, I'd like to see Michael Carter develop more in the passing game because that's a big part of our offense. And he's a lot more quicker than Jordan Brown is. So if you can develop that aspect of him, there's no reason why he couldn't make the running position his own and really be the focal point of our offense. Yeah, it's like I told you yesterday. I mean, you mentioned how well Jordan Brown ran the football 
Um, but but if you're trying to compare the yardage, I mean, you got to look at how many carries Jordan Brown has as well. If Michael Carter gets that many carries, then Michael Carter has more yards than Jordan Brown. It's really that simple. But the thing about Jordan Brown is, is as you said, you want to see Michael Carter become more effective in the receiving game. Jordan Brown is that effective in the receiving game. I mean, for a good portion of this year, you know, mostly due to injuries, he was our leading receiver receptions wise. I mean, he had the most catches on the team for, I mean, I was saying it yesterday. I think it was probably until about week seven or eight of the season, which is just unbelievable that you have a running back that stays, you know, as your leading receiver for that long. But, you know, I, I agree to a certain extent. I think the short yardage back, I, I, think they're going to try to make Jonathan Sutton more into that. I think, you know, they've said that they've been giving him more reps in practice, so I don't know if maybe they're going to try to use him in that role as that big back and kind of focus on short, sort of divvying up the carries between Brown and Carter. But, I, you know, I think Michael Carter definitely deserves, if either one of them is going to get more carries, at this point it's Michael Carter. I mean, he, to me, is the better talent. I think he is probably the guy that will give this offense a little more punch that maybe we haven't had in a little while. And, you know, I, I mean... I don't know. I mean, I, th- I think you've got to give him those carries to see what he's got. At least give him a shot to prove himself. You know, because when he did get him last year, a la Virginia, we saw what happened. So, um, one of the other areas at wide receiver, I know there's a ton of guys, but it seems like Diami Brown is the guy that really is separating himself amongst the freshman receivers. Now, he is the only one that's in there. Antone Green and Jordan Adams, of course, are still in high school. Jordan Adams playing baseball, and we don't really know what that situation is. Uh, Ross Martin tried to clarify that up for us, but uh, did not. that did not go as planned for Ross there. So, But Diami Brown has apparently looked really, really good. And, you know, I, I don't know how much you can take from it, but I believe when I saw him the other day in uh, before the scrimmage, they showed, you know, the groups going out and doing the, uh, the screen drill real quick, you know, in warm-ups. And, you know, it looks like there's, you know, groups of receivers of how they're probably going to lay out as the first group, second group. I'm pretty sure I saw Diami Brown at least in the second group. He might have even been in the first group. So... I know you've seen some stuff. Taylor Vipolis has really been high on him. You know, what do you think about Diami Brown, and do you think he could have an impact in this offense this coming year? Oh, most definitely. We know he's probably going to play, barring injury, because Larry plays freshman. Um, and we saw him last year in high school at the Charlotte Kickoff Classic, and mm-hmm. he just made he made plays um, in the return game, and then of course as a receiver, and you can do a lot of stuff with him, motion him, in the football that kind of way, which I think be good for us because you know we didn't have that really last year um so but yeah i think he's gonna make uh he's gonna make an impact you know hopefully he gets good um rhythm with the with whoever the quarterback is and they have a good connection um but yeah no i think he's gonna make a lot of plays and i mean there's gonna be room for him to he, he may even start depending on how good he does in spring and summer because he's there in the spring whereas some of the other guys won't get there till June or August. So um, definitely he could have a really big year for, for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in the slot – for sure, uh, you know, there's there's going to be an opening, not because I don't think Thomas Jackson is good enough coming off that injury, you know, there, it's still taking him time to get back. So, yeah, maybe if he does make up a good amount of ground in spring camp, uh, Jackson is still out, you know, there could be a void there for him to possibly take over. And I, I agree with you. I think, you know, he definitely has a shot. And we know, yeah, Larry loves his freshmen. Um, you know, I want to see him get some time. But at the same time, if, if he does, if, if neither of those th- if those three get you know a great amount of playing time, you can kind of understand it because you know we see how much talent there really is at the wide receiver position. Turning to the defensive side of the ball, really, I, I think there's been two guys that have really stood out so far that we've seen. Malik Robinson is a guy that everybody's raving about right now. Taylor Vipolis has put out countless things about him. Ross Martin, I think, has been tweeting some stuff about him, too. So he's really been tearing it up. And J.K. Britt has also uh, really had a great fall, or great fall, great spring um, on the back end of that defense. So, you know, are you encouraged by the fact that some of these guys are stepping up at positions where we're going to need guys to uh, step in as replacements? 
Yeah, I mean, it's always good when you have guys that you know that you need to step up when you lost what we lost from last year's team. You know, Andre Smith's gone. MJ Stewart's gone. Donnie Miles is gone. Those were about as sure players as we've had in a long time on the defensive side of the ball. So we got to get guys to replace what they did for us. Um, you know, J.K. Britt, yeah. I mean, I've always been, when he's been in the game, he's made he's made impact. So for him to have a chance to move the starting role, you know, be a leader, that's that's huge. Malik Robinson, yeah. I mean, everybody that's connected with the football program is raving about him. So he must be doing something right if everyone is really talking about him. So it's always good when you know you need guys to step up and contribute to the program. Um, and, and they're they're taking the initiative to do so to help us be better on the defensive side of the ball because the fact is we gave up 31 points per game last year and that's not going to get us where we want to get to um, even I mean even if we score what we normally score that's still not going to get you where you want to go because you you got to be able to stop people especially in the ACC these days. I mean, we look at the offense, how it's been these last couple of years, and it just hasn't been the same offense that we saw early on in the Larry tenure. So, yeah, I agree. The defense des- definitely has to step up. And, you know, we were kind of talking about it yesterday. I think there's kind of an area where we we could set a goal and kind of get to. In between that 24 points per game and 26 points per game area, if we can just get to that point and the offense can even – pick it back up to scoring 30 points a game, I think we could at least, you know, get to a bowl game this year. I don't think this defense is ever going to just suddenly turn around like it seems that most of these fans think in the fan base. It's just not going to happen. But, you know, I I think that the recruiting class that we brought in is definitely going to help to build something on the defensive side of the ball. I feel like John Papuchis is definitely taking a step in the right direction, no matter what these people think. Um, you know, there are people that are still very critical of him because they miss Gene Chizik. I don't see what there is to miss. I didn't think Gene Chizik was all that great um, as a defensive coordinator. I- I'm not saying that he was a bad defensive coordinator, but these people think that, you know, he was the greatest defensive coordinator that we've pretty much ever had, the way they talk about him. Uh, but, I mean, you know, you talked about J.K. Britt on the back end. I mean, last year, you just look, he came in and had to start after Donnie Miles got injured in the Notre Dame game. He finished with 53 tackles, uh, which is, you know, that that's no small stat. Um, I mean, looking at it, he finished, where is he, fifth on the team in tackles. And, and you know, you only he only began starting, what was Notre Dame? I'm, I'm trying to remember right off the top of my head. I think that was, what, the fifth or sixth game of the year? So he yeah, only middle st- of the year. Yeah, so he only started for, you know, uh, half the season, and he comes in and finishes fifth on the team in tackles. Clearly this kid is talented. He had one interception in in, in that time span as well. I forget what game he had it in, but may have been, maybe it was Western. I'm not sure. But you got to think. I mean, he comes in and gets an interception. That matches Donnie Miles' career interceptions. Donnie Miles had one career interception. That's not a bad thing because I feel like Donnie Miles is – Sort of, you know, when I was talking to the draft expert, uh, Daniel Parlagreco, uh, you know, back, uh, God, it's been about a month now. You know, I was talking to him, and yeah, I mean, you know, we, we kind of know what he is. He's kind of that linebacker, that hybrid linebacker safety type. He's going to be that guy that's going to light the stat sheet up with tackles. J.K. Britt's a little different. He's going to play the ball a little more, and that's something that I think we definitely need on the back end. You know, with uh, Miles Dorn had his struggles at times last year. I think Miles Dorn is a good player, but now having a guy back there that can play the ball and help him at times uh, when it comes to, you know, covering the deep parts of the field, that's definitely going to be very helpful. And yeah, Malik Robinson, I mean, we talked about it. You know, Dominic Ross, we've seen it before. You know, we, we've seen some flashes from him that have been really good, but at the same time, we've seen some stuff that we're kind of like, wow, we, you know. We we really thought you know that he was he was you know a little bit better than that um, you know and I I think some of the times that we've seen him out there on the field he hasn't been as productive as we were kind of hoping so maybe Malik Robinson can step in there and at least if anything just push Dominic Ross to be a better player so uh, yeah. any, anything else on the spring storylines man before we uh, start turning and talking about all time great Orioles. No, I, I think that covers the spring for so far. I still got one week to go. So yeah, yeah, and then uh, amazingly, uh, spring football is already over. That's that's just crazy to think. But we, I mean, at this point, we don't care. We're we're like uh, I saw a guy on Twitter yesterday say, "I'm just looking forward to meet the heels," and I think 
that's kind of where we're at at this point. So Yeah, right. So, yeah, I mean, t- turning to the uh, greatest player bracket, this was something that I started, you know, during the first four of the tournament. I was just sitting there during, you know, during the 16 versus 16 game. I don't even remember which one it was. I think, what was it? The first one was like LIU, Brooklyn, and somebody. They got destroyed. Uh, so I was like, all right, I'm going to set up this bracket and see what we got. And, you know, I, I came to, you know, a, a, a it came to a pretty good conclusion that Lawrence Taylor was the greatest player of all time. Um, I I don't think anybody's going to really disagree with that, but I mean, if you look at his stats in college, I mean, he really wasn't as dominant a player as he was at the NFL level. So let me ask you, are you okay with Lawrence Taylor being the greatest Tar Heel of all time, according to the fan base? Yeah, because that's who I voted for in the, in the bracket. So yeah, I'm, I'm okay with him being the, the greatest Tar Heel ever, without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, one of the ones that I think a lot of people were shocked was that by was that uh, he wasn't he didn't end up facing Charlie Choo Choo Justice at the very end. I mean, this is a guy that was you know considered a, almost a Heisman winner back. I think, I think he finished second in the race back in forty nine. If I have the year correctly, it's either forty nine or forty eight. Um, and he didn't even make the final. He got beat out by Julius Peppers. You know, I, I mean, does. Yeah, is that? I wonder if that's sort of the Carolina Panthers type influence, or do people actually truly believe that Julius Peppers is better than Charlie Choo Choo Justice? I mean, I don't know. Did you vote for Julius Peppers in that? I believe I did. I think the reason why that ended up going the way it did is because, like, unless you're seventy something, eighty something years old, we don't have any footage of Charlie Justice. We never saw him play. Uh, we know nothing about him other than what we've read and what we've heard, and then his statues outside Keenan Stadium. Now that might not be fair, but that's just you know in today's era, and especially doing it on Twitter. Normally, it's our generation on Twitter, the millennials. Um, right. They've been watching Julius Pepper since they were five years old, you know, and like you said, for the most part, sacking the opponent's quarterback for your hometown team with, as Panther fans. So. Um, like, in some ways, it could be flawed because of the way that it went, because it was on Twitter. and But we, we've never seen Charlie Justice play. We just read and heard about him. And that probably hinders him. He probably is regarded to some people as the greatest Tar Heel ever because of what he did in the for the program in the late 40s. But the thing is, is we we never saw it. And it might not be fair to him, but that, you know, in that kind of polling, that's just how it's probably going to go. Yeah, I mean, you're you're definitely right on that. And, you know, I, I thought it was kind of interesting. I mean, honestly, I, I, I remember when I set up the bracket and, and then kind of went back and looked at it, I was almost kind of worried he wouldn't even make the final because, you know, I looked at it and I was like, okay, you know, there, there might be a chance that he gets beat out by Gio Bernard. Um, which, you know, I think there's a lot of people that would say, well, you know, how could you actually justify – uh, you know, him getting beat out by Gio Bernard. But honestly, I mean, you look at it and, I mean, you know, there is an argument for Gio in the fact that, you know, what what could have happened if Gio had stayed instead of going to the NFL? I mean, <laughs> you really don't know. He could have ended up being a sensational player because both of his years that he was on campus and, and played, he ran for, um, I, I, what, what I saw yesterday, both of them were over 1,200 yards. So that's... I mean, you got to think at that pace, he would have he he would have smashed the record of uh, most rushing yards held by Amos Lawrence, who was another guy that I thought maybe had a chance against Dre Bly in his part of the bracket and just got just got destroyed in that matchup. Um, you know, I'd, um, one that I thought was interesting, and I know you're gonna you, you you'll want to talk about this, Ryan Switzer, after nearly getting beat in the first round by his fellow teammate Mac Hollins. Uh, they ended up actually having to go to uh, overtime, per se. I, I put up a poll for five minutes to see who would end up winning after they were tied. He ends up going all the way to the Elite Eight and then gets beat by Julius Peppers. Um, one, that was something that a lot of people took conflict with. Do you think that I was justified in putting Ryan Switzer as a one seed? Uh, I don't know if he was necessarily a one seed. I know for you and I as fans, you know, he's both of our favorite Tar Heel football players that we've gotten to see play. Um, I mean, he had good numbers, but, like, I don't I don't know. I mean, like, the thing that with the Matt Collins thing, like, okay, 
on the field, he was better than Matt Collins, but everyone just loved Matt Collins because he had a good story as a walk-on um, and was always very good with the fans. So the fans had an emotional tie to him. But, like, I had no problem with Julius Peppers beating him because on the field, Peppers was a better player than he was at the time at UNC. Um, but, I mean, I get why you put him as a one seed because I know that's your favorite player. And, I mean, in the Larry era, he's probably the most electrifying player we, we got to see play. So, I mean, I'll, I'll back you up on that. I mean, I kind of looked at it, really, I tried to take the unbiased look at it in that, I mean, you got to think, he leads us in every receiving category career-wise except touchdowns. And then the punt return category, he holds every record there. So, I mean, that's kind of how I looked at it. You know, I, I can see where people were a little bit angry, but, I mean, these people that thought he was supposed to be, you know, like a middle-of-the-pack seed, I, I just don't understand what they're seeing. I mean, this guy was one of, I mean, I think he is one of the top five greatest players in Carolina history because of just everything that he did. And, I mean, yeah, we're, we're going to get, you know, even if we believe that, we're going to get smashed as being, yeah, the millennials or, you know, the, the fanboys. But really, it's just... I mean, look at it. The stats are there to prove it. And, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I had no problem, like you said, with him getting beat by Julius Peppers because I think that was a great matchup, and that was one that I definitely wanted to see. Um, so, I mean, and it worked out. Julius Peppers ends up going to the finals. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I know one of the other ones a lot of people took, uh, took offense to, I, I mean, and I mean a lot of people, was Kelvin Bryant being a seven seed. Um, in the South bracket, I mean, I, you know, we know a little bit about Kelvin Bryant, but did you think that that was, did, did you agree with these people that that was really a, a huge misseeding? No, I, I, I mean, cause it, I mean, I know a little bit about him. I mean, I'm not as informed as some other fans probably were. So no, I didn't have a problem with him being a, a seven seed. Um, and I mean, my thing is, is like, I mean, this was supposed to be fun for the people that were like, getting butthurt over your seedings, they need like a reality check in my opinion because you were just doing it for something fun because that's what happens during tournament time. Everyone puts out these other brackets of all this other stuff and it's just supposed to be for fun. It's not anything to be taken like life or death or anything, you know? Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, and my thing was, you know, I, I kind of just passed over that with the fact that, I mean, look, he didn't even beat Marquise Williams in the round of 32. Keese beat him by a pretty good amount, too. So if you really felt that way, then that wouldn't have ended up being the outcome. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely thought it was it was something fun. And I, I think, you know, a lot of people were able to interact with it. And, you know, in the end, you know, I don't think I don't think any of us were very shocked by the fact that Lawrence Taylor won it. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I think people can kind of see, you know, it, it kind of allows you to put it into perspective that, hey, you know, maybe it's not as clear cut. I think if you asked a lot of a lot of Tar Heel fans right off the bat, who's the best Tar Heel football player ever? You know, Lawrence Taylor would probably be the answer. But you can see now just through this bracket that, hey, you know, Charlie Choo Choo Justice has an argument. Julius Peppers has an argument. Dre Bly could possibly have an argument. Maybe even Amos Lawrence. These guys do have an argument, and that was kind of what I was just trying to do. But, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, if anybody is really that devastated over this bracket, oh, my. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, at this point, you know, we're just, we were just trying to, you know, I was just trying to have fun. But, you know, apparently no one can have fun around here. Um, you know, so turning – to our last topic of discussion, it's going to be the 2019 recruiting class. So far, three commitments in the class. Uh, the cornerback, Jaden Curry, who goes to IMG Academy, transferred from, I don't remember, I think it was Woodbridge High School in Virginia. I'm not 100% on uh, the school name there. But I know he went down to IMG Academy. Uh, if I read the stats right, he didn't play last year. Um, or maybe he played on one of their secondary teams. He didn't play with the big boys, but this year he is going to go up and play with the number one group, so that'll be a good chance to see him. Um, and then outside linebacker Alan Smith, who just committed the other day, uh, another three-star. You know, I watched his tape, definitely a guy that is very intriguing, and Coleman Reich, the three-star athlete right here out of the state of North Carolina, goes for to Ledford High School. Um up in, I think it's, uh, I think that's in Thomasville, North Carolina. So, 
Um, you know, nothing to be extremely blown away by to this point. But, you know, I kind of wanted to ask you, you know, right now, you know, how do you feel about where this class stands, you know, na- ra- rankings-wise nationally and even in the ACC? I mean, they've already got, you know, three commits, which, you know, it's always it's, it's a good start. I mean, recruiting is an everyday job for those guys, even when they're not allowed to – talk to recruits or whatever it's still a you know you think about it every day of every hour because it's how you run your program so the fact that you know we've already got three commits early um in the process since we finalized the 18 class is good i mean i think laws and health with NCAA finally being off campus so these kids got to understand okay well we know they're you know we can go here and play for ACC championships and go to bowl games and do what we want to do on the field as well in, in the classroom. So um, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with what Larry's doing. I mean, you get a an athlete, which is always good for us, and you get some defensive players. I mean, I'm always looking to get better defensively. So um, I don't have nothing to complain about it right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the interesting thing, I, I think, you know, we kind of we kind of know Coleman Reich is is extremely committed. You know, there was an article that was released the other day about how he's trying to learn the coaching staff. But right now, I mean, I'm not really that concerned about him. Alan Smith, uh, there should be no concern about that. He just committed. So, you know, clearly he likes what he sees in the coaching staff and has a good relationship with him. And again, you know, the thing that I really take away from that is we are continue to build this Georgia pipeline that we have done such a great job of building Man, Larry has really hammered the state of Georgia. The, really there, and, and he, that upper part of Florida, right near the Jacksonville area, he has just done such great things up there. And you know, holding on to Jaden Curry, I think is going to be the main thing. We've got to be able to, you know, hold on to him. This is a guy that's been committed to us for a long time. I think he committed to us last June. And you know, those type of commitments, you know, those are the ones that always concern me the most when it comes to these these classes. Is you know, these guys that committed. You know, back even before their junior year. I mean, we saw it with Hakeem Beaman. He ends up, you know, decommitting. You know, but, but that was one. I don't know about you, but me, I kind of expected that. I mean, we had heard of all along that hey, you know, this kid is getting these big time offers. He, I mean, I forget what they what what I read in the article exactly, but I think they said something like he hadn't been in contact with us in almost two months or something before he decommitted. So stuff like that is just, I mean, that you know, it, it, that's the thing that concerns me with these early commits. Um, I mean, you know, we, we're looking at some of the guys really in our state as well. Outside linebacker Jalen Scott ended up releasing his top four the other day. We're in that. Um, I think the biggest concern there is probably Clemson. But if we can beat out Clemson, that would be huge. Comes out of Shelby High School where Dax Hollifield was from. So sort of a good thing to look at there is that Virginia Tech is not one of his top four. So that means that he's not just going to go and play with Dax Hollifield. He's kind of, you know, having his own commitment and sort of finding himself, you know, so hopefully, you know, we can end up swinging him. There's a couple other in-state guys. I know the one that we want big time is Sam Howell from right here in Indian Trail. Um, And, you know, they're, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that there's anything, you know, great going on, but, uh, you know, Keith Heckendorf, I think, has a great relationship with him. And, you know, right now on 24-7 Sports, we're one of, I think, three teams that are currently, that have moved up from cold to warm. Uh, but the thing about him is, I mean, I've been I've been covering him since his freshman year. There's so, I mean, it's so hard to read his recruiting. He has done such a great job of just kind of keeping it under wraps and, you know, keep, you know, focusing on you know what he has to do to try to make himself a better player and 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 start to figure out where he's going to go so um you know i know you know is there any uh any other guys you, you want to mention that maybe you've seen i know you're not massively into recruiting but uh, i don't know if you've seen any other guys no i don't have anybody that comes to mind off the top of my head so all right man but uh yeah, I mean, so you know, we'll we'll definitely keep an eye on that, and as always, check out keep keep it tuned to the blog, guys. Go ahead and check that out. There's there's an article on Alan Smith in there if you want to learn just a little bit about him and his commitment. Um, and then we'll we'll definitely be keeping an eye on the recruiting trails as recruiting should heat up here. Uh, you know, over the summer, a lot of guys that are going to be seniors are probably going to pull the trigger on commitments. Now, the thing is, is how how you know 
how rock solid these actually are. Uh, no one really knows, so don't sell the house on these guys. And I, I beg, I beg of the fan base. I do this all the time. Please do not tweet at the recruits. Please do not tweet at them if they don't commit to Carolina and and bash these guys. Um, I mean, the the only one with the exception, and it wasn't even really bashing, was Peyton Wilson. That was definitely justified when he called out the uh, the, the university which he was committed to for how long. You know, certain circumstances like that are a little bit different. But please don't tweet at these guys and tell them to commit there. Let these guys run their own commitment. This is their life. This is a huge decision for these guys. I don't think people understand how actually big this is for these kids. How much pressure you've got from your, you know, yourself, and then your coaches, your family, the football coaches that are trying to recruit you, the media. I mean, it's just so much going on. So, you know, just please, please stay off the social media when it comes to tweeting at recruits. So, uh, hey, man, thanks for coming on, man. This is awesome. You know I always love having you on, man, because you know so much about Tar Heel football. And, you know, we, we love talking Tar Heel football all the time. So, hey, anytime you want to be on, man, just let me know, all right? All right, no problem, dude. All right, buddy. You take care, all right? All right, you too, man. All right, later. All right. All right, guys, so we want to thank you for listening. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at Future Tar Heel. You can follow Josh on Twitter at Josh Marlow 5 He's going to, uh, you know, he tweets all the time about Tar Heel football. And, of course, I'm always tweeting about Tar Heel football. Check out the blog, Heel Tough blog on Medium.com. Just go to my page, uh, my, my Twitter page as well. Facebook page has plenty of stuff on there. And then uh, Heel Tough blog podcast that you're listening to right now. Go ahead and subscribe. You can do it on Spreaker.com. We're on iTunes now. Google Play's even got us on there. Uh, iHeartRadio just picked us up the other day. TuneIn app also. So there's plenty of places to listen to it, guys. Go ahead and subscribe and come back every week. You know, we're going to try to do something. There's going to be more interviews coming up. Check out the Bren Renner interview. Unbelievable interview with Bren Renner. Love that guy. Just great stuff with him, the former Tar Heel quarterback. Got Taylor Vipolis, who did a spring update for us. You know, you just heard us talk about the spring, man. Taylor Vipolis is on a different level. He's out there every day. He knows everything that's going on. So go ahead and listen to that right there. Pat James has some stuff that we talked to him. The guy, the, uh, Go Heels reporter for the Tar Heels football team. Uh, I know he's actually uh, for all sports, so he knows what he's talking about. Some great stuff there. Um, and then also, uh, you know, we're going to have, uh, you know, a couple of guys that we're going to be talking to. Going to try to get Daniel Parla Greco back on for draft talk right before the draft um, on the Tar Heel prospects. Either we're going to have him on before the draft or we're going to have him on after the draft to kind of break down what he sees uh, from those guys and wh- how they fit where they're going. So, uh, you know, thanks for listening, guys. And as always, go Tar Heels.